God is good. Okay, uh, who knows what a definition of habitat means? If you don't raise your hand, I'm just going to volunteer you, so. Okay, what does habitat mean? Okay, that's, that's very good words. I'm going to volunteer somebody else here, too. Jake, what does habitat mean? Were you in the first service? Okay, what does it mean? Okay, that sounds cool. That's probably good enough, Al. Can you add to that, or is that okay? He nailed it. Isn't that a dwelling place? Yep. <laughs> How many are familiar with Habitat for Humanity? Okay, obviously they build houses for people to live in, right? So Habitat is a place to live. It's where you reside. It's a place you call home. It's your shelter, your home, your environment that you're in. And uh, if you see up on the screen, you're going to find out that God has habitation as well. He has a place that he chooses to live in. He has a place where he chooses to be and where you find him, where he resides other than heaven. He has a residence. First John 4.12. I want to share quite a few scriptures with you this morning. Because I want you to catch this, because I cannot convey this in my own strength or my own wisdom. I cannot convey what I'm trying to by myself. So we be praying the Holy Spirit will make it real to us. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives. Now I'm going to need some help. God lives. And his love is made complete in us. God lives in us. Hey, that's pretty awesome, isn't it? That's a habitation. If you went to John 14, 23, you'll find it again. Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teachings. Now, that's what we are as Christians. We, we, we learn the teachings of God, the word of God, to obey God. He says, so if anyone obeys my teaching, not just hears them, but obeys them, my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Can you imagine the God of the universe who spoke it into being that needs nothing, that is everywhere, omnipresent, omniscient, knows everything. Uh, this great God that uh, he said, I'm going to make my home with you and in you. How cool is that? He's going to reside there. He's going to be there, not just a hunting camp, where you might go on a weekend or here and there or visit, not just a summer cottage where you might hit and miss go to, but a place to reside permanently. Now, God could choose any place or no place because he once said to, uh, in the Old Testament prophets and kings, he says, who do you think you are that you want to build me a house to live in? Can any house contain God? Can you imagine building a house worthy enough for God? But what he says is, I'm going to live in you. You're going to be my temple. You're going to be my home. You're going to be the place I want to dwell in. If you go to Ephesians 2.22, he makes it a little clearer. He says, and in him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now, here's God's plan and always has been. In Jesus Christ... And through the work he did on the cross, he said, you are being built together. Now we're talking about a building here. You are being built together to become a dwelling place which God lives by his spirit. So he always intended that you would be the place he would live. And he's working on that project to make us into a temple that he desires to dwell in. Now that word dwelling means permanency. It's a place to live. A place to dwell. And that's the believer in Jesus Christ. We are a very special building. 1 Corinthians 3.16. You're not just a shack out on the tree line somewhere. You're not just a, a chicken coop. Sorry, Pastor Jason. <laughs> He's building one. It says, don't you know that you yourselves are God's... Oh, that was weak. Don't you know 
that you yourselves are God's and that God's Spirit lives in you. Do you know that? Let me know that. You yourselves, how could it be any clearer? You yourselves, you say, who? I wonder which one of us here. If you're in Jesus Christ today, you're a believer. He says, you yourselves are God's temple, that God's Spirit lives in you. We're trying to establish that dwelling place now that God has. We are his temple. And this is where heaven and earth meet. He comes to live in us. And there's a reason that he comes to live in us. Always has been. You see, in the Old Testament, in the temples where they built for him, it was a place for them to meet with God. And he comes to live in us now for the same reason. Here it is. So that his greatness and his glory and his purposes and his character can be revealed in us and through us. If you go to a nice temple, you go inside, and it's, it's an awesome place if you've ever been to one. They use the best. In the Old Testament, it was gold and silver and, and special wood, and, and everything was beautiful and perfect. And, and the average person walked in there, oh, look at this, because they never had anything. And, and uh, this was a special, beautiful place, and it was fit for a king. And this is what God is telling us. He's not just building a shack. He doesn't just call you some rundown place. He says he's coming into a temple fit for Jesus Christ to live in. You're very special to God. And the building he's making out of your life is fit for his son Jesus Christ. Ephesians 4.14 uh, it talks about, Then we no longer will be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. When God takes up residency in your life, he brings three things. He brings the way. Now, you can't come to God except through Jesus Christ. He's the way. And so we need to know that there is no other way. It's through Jesus Christ. He brings truth. And when he brings truth in his word, we're no longer tossed around by all the philosophies of man and all the ideas of our culture because we have his truth hidden in our hearts and it gives us stability. And he's a life. He brings life into our hearts. Now here's the question I would ask. As God puts his residency in our lives by the Holy Spirit, is God glorified in our lives? Is he being praised by our life and our lifestyles? Is he being shown forth to a world that doesn't know him? Do we represent Jesus Christ well by our temple and what people see? Now, I think it's sometimes like a new husband. He, uh, he's going to take a wife, and he wants to go and, and have a place to live that's suitable for that new bride. The best he can do. If you were in the Old Testament times and in, in Israel, uh, basically here's what happened. They got engaged. It was the same as getting married, but the husband left, and he would go for a while to prepare a dwelling place for his bride. And when he was done preparing all of that, we might want to take some notes here if you're a young person. Prepare when he had made it all the arrangements uh, 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 that he needed when he took the time when he thought it through then he came back and he married the girl he was engaged to and it's sort of like what God is doing here you see when when he comes into our life when he chooses us to to serve him and he's going to place his Holy Spirit in our life, he's going to reside in us he wants to build a temple he wants to build a building that is suitable for him to dwell in now, I want that to soak in a little bit, and we're going to find out what that's going to look like. You see, when God told Moses in the wilderness he wanted to build a, a place for God to live in, uh, he did something very, very uh, explicit, Exodus 25, 8 and 9. You want a place for God to live? Here's what I want you to do, Moses. Okay, I, I'm going to let you do it. He said, then make, make a sanctuary for me, or a place where I will dwell among them, Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. Now, Moses, you're going to make this, you're going to make this sanctuary for me. I'm going to live there. I'm going to dwell there. But I want you to make it exactly like I show you. I have a reason for it. I have a purpose for it. I want you to build it just like I tell you. Use the pattern I give you. 
How many know that God has a pattern, a plan for your own life? God is not just saving you to wander around aimlessly. God is, going to, is, is building a temple in your life that he can dwell in, that he can show forth his glory, and he wants it to be done the way his word tells us, explicitly. And sometimes we have so much trouble doing this, we don't understand it because we're not willing to uh, follow his pattern, follow his word, and uh, we, we don't want to make a place that's suitable for him to dwell in. And, uh, but he told Moses, you do it exactly the way I tell you. Because if I'm going to build a place where I'll feel at home in. Now, uh, I think we have to realize, folks, I, I don't understand today why we have such a low in, uh, respect for who God is. It's like, oh, the dude upstairs. Oh, that, you know, the man upstairs, or the, that guy, or that's good. You know, we, we don't have a, a, a real grab on respecting the awesomeness of God. I mean, in the Old Testament, they respected God so much they didn't even spell the whole word. They left a letter out because they didn't even feel worthy to mention the, the whole name God or to spell it out. And uh, I don't know, we seem to be very uh, much at peace with uh, just um, belittling it or making him small. I don't know if you heard what I heard yesterday, but... Um, you know, through the social media and these uh, programs on there where you... How many know you can sell somebody something, anybody? You, you can sell anything to somebody, huh? Well, I found out it's true. One man on the Internet wanted to sell his soul. Now, I'll tell you, do, do we need God's Word or not to realize the seriousness of life and heaven and hell and salvation and... Uh, for, for one thing, if he'd know that your, your, your soul isn't to be bought and sold. And uh, the second thing I thought, I listened a little longer, and one person said, I'm going to sell my place in heaven to somebody. I'm going to sell my place in heaven. The last bid was $100,000. And then they took it off because they said, because heaven, is, you know, something like selling your place in heaven... That's not tangible, you know, you can't feel, touch, smell it, so we can't put that on. So they took it off, but, but they had already bid up to $100,000 to buy someone's place in heaven. How many know you can't do that? Yeah. We have such a, a, a shallow concept of eternal things and of God himself. And that makes a difference when we find out that God wants to live in our life. And so God told Moses, you make it exactly like I tell you to do it. So what would this all look like? If How are we going to get a concept of God? Well, the Bible tells us there's an apostle, the last one living, his name was John. And one day, as he was a slave in the, in the mines, and uh, uh, in the Roman mines, one day he was praying, and God gave him a vision or took him to heaven. We don't know which exactly for sure. But in that vision, we'll call it this morning, he's seen something. Revelations 4, 1 and 2 tells us that. He's given a little tour of heaven now. He said, after this I, John, looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. How many of you would like to see a door and it opens up to heaven? How many uh, would be a little bit hesitant to open that door? Now, some of us, oh, let me take a look. How big do you walk in there and do all this? Uh, you know, we have no, no, no respect, no awe of God, no fear of God. So there's a door. Now, we've read books and all of these things about heaven, but here John is, you know, as an angel appears to him, like he's almost like dead. He's on the ground. He thinks, I've had it. And now he sees this door. It's open. Well, he doesn't go in. He says, I ain't going in there. You know, I'm, I, I'm not sure what I'm going to find there if, or, or if I'm welcome there if, or if I can enter there. It might be a holy place. And Anyway, he heard a voice. And it heard speaking to him, and he said, it's like a trumpet. Now, if you see a door open in heaven, and, and you hear voices, and they sound like trumpet blasts, you may not want to go in. But uh, that's what he heard. And the voice said, come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. And at once, he said, I was in the Spirit. And there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on that throne. 
Now, who do you suppose was sitting on the throne? Okay. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Doesn't the Bible say that Stephen had this vision and there was Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father? And then he stood up. So he sees Jesus sitting on the right hand of the Father on the throne of authority and power and sovereignty and, and all of these things. And uh, it really leaves an impression on him. He gets the message. And here's the message I want you to get. John got the message as he sees it. You know, the trumpets are blasting and the door is open there. And, and it's, it's like, wow, you know. And, and the voice is telling him to come forward. And then he sees Jesus sitting on the throne. And he doesn't know what to do with himself. And uh, he, gets, he gets the message. Here's the message. John realizes that Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He doesn't see a little baby in a manger. He doesn't see Jesus hanging on a cross. He sees him sitting at the right hand of the Father in power and glory and majesty and authority. He's in a place of sovereignty for the whole universe. And if Jesus dwells in a place like that, and if the earthly tabernacle, the message came clear and it was this, he's on the throne, folks. It's his authority to govern and rule. Now, I want you to catch this. Now, that's the throne he sees in heaven. But now what does Jesus say? He said, I've come to dwell where? In you. This same Jesus on the throne, full of authority, power, and glory, and honor. He has now come to dwell within you. God in us. God with us. The hope of glory. We're going to go to... Philippians 2, 9, 11, and catch this from the scripture writers. Therefore God exalted Jesus to the highest place, and he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So what John is seeing that, hey, Jesus is Lord. He's the king. He's the boss. His throne that he sits on. There's not a problem. Nobody questions his rule. He's sovereign. And if God is to be glorified in us, and I believe John caught this message, if God is to be glorified in us, if we're to experience his presence and his fullness like he wants us to, we must let him sit on the throne of our lives. Now the problem is, we often have a battle with that, don't we? We receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. Thank you, Lord, for forgiving my sins. I'm lost, and, and uh, thanks for the peace and the forgiveness and the joy you put into my life. And then, and then God you know, begins that process of, of making that temple, our lives, into something worthy of his dwelling. And then we stop and say, uh, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, God. You can't do this. You can't tell me this, or you can't take that, or you can't move me in that direction. I want, I'm used to calling the shots here, God. Listen, there cannot be two people on your throne. There can only be you, or there can be Jesus Christ. I'm talking to you that know Jesus Christ right now. And uh, the awesomeness of God dwelling with us, you know, should cause us to say, hey, no problem, you're, you're on the throne, God. You know better than me, and you're, you're awesome, you're holy, you're wonderful, and uh, you've got a plan and a purpose for me, and, and I, I just want to step aside and put you on the throne of my life. You call the shots. You tell me, like uh, Saul said when he got knocked off his horse on the way to Damascus, Lord, what would you have me do? What would you have me to do? Put him on the throne. We sometimes have a battle with that, don't we? And so we are the temple of the living God, but we have to decide who is going to be the king of our lives, us or God. And now he begins to see a few other things. He goes in Revelations 4.8. Revelations 4.8. Each of the four living creatures, and I don't have time to explain you what all these are, but in heaven he sees these four living creatures. And they had six wings. Man, you could cruise with that. You know, people that like speed, that catches your eye. 
They had six wings. And it was covered, their eyes were all around. And they say had all these eyes, but they covered them with their wings. Even under his wings. Day and night, here's what they do. Day and night, they never stop saying, now I want you to read with me. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now listen, we're talking about the Lord God Almighty that he sees in heaven. And he sees all these awesome things around him, but they're, they're kind of paling in significance to the fact that he sees Jesus on the throne and he hears what's going on there and the majesty of it. And, and all he can do is, is cry with the angels, holy, holy, holy. Listen, that's all they do all day. You read that? Day and night, they never stop. Now, that's, that's not a technical thing that they have to do and say, oh, I've got to do this, I'll do it. No. When they see and are in the presence of an almighty God and his holiness and his glory, they want to do it. There's nothing else they can do. And here, John, he's laying on the ground. <laughs> he don't even dare move. And, and uh, these angels in heaven, you know, in, in, the, in the heavenly temple are, are flying around there and they're crying, holy, holy, holy. They never stop. Because God is so awesome. They, they just don't want the words to describe him. How can you describe God? You're going to run out of words. And they say he's holy, holy, holy. They worship him. They praise him. It comes from, uh, it just comes from their innermost being. The holiness of God. They see a place that's pure. They see a place that is righteous. They see a place that is clean and holy. God's presence in your life will do that for you. You see, what makes us holy isn't our good works. What makes us holy and righteous isn't anything good we have done. But it's what Jesus Christ has done. He alone is holy. And when he brings that into, he comes in to live in our life by the Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, that's exactly what he's called, the Holy Spirit. When he comes in, he brings his holiness into our lives to work it out through us. So that we can revere and praise and worship God as well. 1 Corinthians 3.17. Here's what happened when you get saved. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little about it. It says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is, and you are that. You see, what's, what makes your life sacred and holy is God in you. When Jesus comes into your life, he sanctifies you. He brings who he is into your temple. And he abides with you. He doesn't just visit you. He stays there. Can you imagine the influence of a holy God living in your life over time? Man, that's going to work some things out. Cool, huh? It's going to produce holiness in us. It's going to produce Christ-likeness in us. You ever heard of a thing called the fruit of the Spirit? And what is God's goal for us anyway? What is that going to look like when he builds that temple? That we are be conformed unto the image of Jesus Christ. Into his likeness. Man, I'll tell you what. When you start reading the Bible, you want to know how you should act and how you should speak and how you should uh, 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 conduct your life. You just start reading the Bible. It says, follow his example, our high priest, who was not always tempted like we are, yet without sin. He said, well, I'm not God. No, but God is in you, and he's working. He's working to reproduce his son, Jesus Christ, in your life, your speech, your talk, your actions, your relationships, your habits, your dress, your conduct. Do you want Christ in you? If he's going to be in us, he's going to start working on that temple. He's going to start rearranging some things. Are we prepared to make a suitable dwelling place for Jesus Christ? I was wondering how to illustrate this, and I thought of my wife. She's here today, so I can use this illustration. But if you were to be a guest at our house, you would not have to worry about sleeping on dirty sheets, dirty pillows. You would not have to worry about the bedroom that you're in being messed up and junky. You would not have to worry about going into the bathroom, wondering where the towels are, wondering where the washcloths were, finding hair in the tub. 
finding toothpaste in the sink. You know how you leave your bathroom. You wouldn't find it like that. You wouldn't find garbage on the floor. You wouldn't find yesterday's meal on the table. You wouldn't find things in a disarray and a mess. And my wife's like that. She, she believes that when we accompany, we should take care of them. We should honor them. Not because they want to think we're so wonderful, but because we want to honor those guests that come to dwell in our house or come to visit our house. Are you getting the message? How much more so for a holy God? Should we allow him to clean the clutter and the junk and the mess? How much more should we cooperate with the Holy Spirit in letting those things be taken out uh, so that it's a suitable place for a holy God to dwell? God wants to live within us. How awesome can that be? The God of heaven wants to live within us. And what kind of temple would we allow him to make? When they got a glimpse of God's dwelling place in heaven, his holiness, his honor, the praise, the worship, a wonderful place, an awesome place. It was a place fit for God, for who he is. And John wanted to be at his best from then on because he seen that God in that place wanted to dwell in his life. And so the words of his mouth became very important, how, what he said and how he said. We're, we're very crude with our words these days. And some people say, well, you know, if Jesus was right here with me and, and, and w w walked with me where, where I went, I probably would say things different or I probably would look at, wouldn't look at some things or I probably wouldn't do some things. But so we think as soon as we're out of church, God doesn't see us. But God want, is living right inside of us. He's working constantly. And so John said, I, I want to have a temple that's fit for God. And so the Bible says in one of the scriptures, he said, Let's set aside those sins and those problems that separate us from God, that so easily beset us. Let's be more conscious. Let's listen to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to us about our actions and our activities and our relationships because God is dwelling inside of us. Well, that was John's vision. He wasn't the only one that caught it. The theme runs all through the Bible. King David realized it, and here's his prayer. He said these words, wash away all my sins and cleanse me, God. Cleanse me and I'll be clean. Create in me a pure heart, O oh God. He wanted a dwelling place. He knew what the temple was. He wanted to build God a temple. But his son did. But David realized what should be in that temple. Our hearts. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. I'll wait to get to that one. Is that the one I had problems with today? <laughs> Earlier? Okay. Here it is. Since we have these promises, and you can read it yourself for the promises that God gave us. Listen, folks. God wants a wonderful relationship with us. And he just feels that we want a wonderful relationship with him. He wants to be our friend. He wants to be our God. He wants to reveal himself to us. He wants to be intimate with us and... And have us to know him. He doesn't want us to hold us. Oh, I think there's a God up there somewhere. We have the privilege of knowing him through Jesus Christ. And Jesus told his disciples, you've been with me three and a half years. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus was that intimate revelation of who the Father was. So you have these promises. And listen, dear friends. Let us do what? Purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit. Perfecting holiness out of what? Reverence. Reverence. You say, well, uh, well, I'm not going to do it. I have to do this. I can't say this. I have to do all these rules. No, he said, he said let's, let's perfect holiness out of reverence for God. God, I want to please you. You're awesome. You're so great. And I, that I have the privilege of knowing you, let alone you living within me. And I, I want to reverence you, God. I don't, want just, I don't want to just treat you any old way or just have a, 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 a dirty old place for you to live in and have you just take the crumbs left over. He said, but let's purify ourselves from everything that contaminates the body and the spirit. And let's perfect holiness out of reverence for God. 
Oh, that we would have a reverence for God and who He is. And you know the Holy Spirit wants to help us in this remodeling project. You know, folks, when we got saved, Jesus started work on that temple. Maybe your temple wasn't too much when He started working with you. Maybe when you gave your life to Jesus Christ, your life was a mess. You know, even if it wasn't a mess, it was a mess. But some people think, well, I'm pretty good. I don't really need them, but I guess I'll say the words just in case. That's a bigger mess than the one that pounds his chest. And, oh, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. There's not much here, Lord, but if you want it, you can have it. Please come into my life. Asking a holy God, the God of heaven, to come into your life. How awesome. And he does. He does. And that's the start of the remodeling process. That temple may look different than it's going to look, but you've got to start 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. I love those verses. Do, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Is there anybody here that doesn't know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? Who is, you may have here now, in you, who is in you, whom you have received from God, you are not your own. Now here's the start of salvation. Here's the start of following God. You were bought with a What was that price? Jesus gave his life for you. He shed his blood. It wasn't gold or silver, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ that he paid for you. He bought you back. Therefore, honor God with your Get that word? Honor God with your body. You've been bought with a price. How awesome. And now God is doing a great work in your life. The repair work has started. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us how it looks. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anybody receives Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, if anyone becomes a believer... If anyone gives his life to Jesus Christ, he is a new creation. Okay. New creation. God's not going to leave us. He'll come to dwell in you no matter what you look like right now, if you ask him to. But he's going to make you a new creation. He's going to start working on that temple. And the old will be gone. That's what he's working on. You see, he's working on you to be Conform to the image of Jesus Christ. I don't look like too much like Jesus right now, Father. Yeah, but I'm going to work on it. i got my Holy Spirit working on it right now. And that old is going to leave. And new is going to come. I want you to get the picture. Jesus Christ buys us all run down, beat up, dilapidated temple. And we say, oh, <laughs> got a sucker here. He ain't getting anything. You can have that. But God looked at you and loved you. He said, I died for you. And if you let me repossess that building, I'll start working on it. And I'm going to make, i got a plan in my rates. It's a beautiful plan. And so he comes in and he starts tearing down walls. And then all of a sudden, building stops because, he, whoa, God, you can't touch that wall. You can't go in there. You can't clean that one out. You're not allowed. And you see, we can stop God's building process wherever we want to. Now, you know, not having a suitable place is fine for God when he first comes in there. He expects that. He expects a clean out and remodeling. But what he doesn't expect us is to stay cluttered. Because God's a holy God. And he dwells in holiness. And he's making holy people out of us. And when we stop his work, it's called grieving the Holy Spirit. No, God, you can't. Sorry, I won't let you. And that grieves God because that stops his plans and his purposes in our lives. It stops the, 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 the intimacy. It stops the, the uh, revelations. It's, it stops the, the peace and the joy and all those things because God is wanting to do something and we're saying no so we resist him and that hurts the heart of God stops his plan 
but when we cooperate. <laughs> you say, how do I cooperate, Pastor? And I'll leave you with this last scripture, Romans 12, 1. Here's how we do it. Therefore, I urge you, now that word urge isn't just a suggestion, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Now that's only your spiritual act of worship and in King James, it's only your reasonable service. Because I gave my life to Jesus, why would I want to resist what he's doing there? Why would I not want him to make this a holy place? To a place where he's on the throne, cleaned out, pure. I want to be pure. I want to be Christ-like. I don't want to be like I have been. That's why I gave my life to Jesus. So here I am, God. Work in me. I present myself a living sacrifice. In other words, I'm cooperating with you, God. Whatever you want to do, you can do it. And when you find people like that, you see growth. You see changes in their lives. And you know what you begin to see? You start seeing Christ in them. Oh, they used to be like that. I can't believe that. What, what happened to them? I mean, they used to be so angry and they used to be so mean-spirited and they used to have a mouth that a sailor would blush and they used to, you know, they used to be out, picked up every weekend and on and on they go. And they used to, all the thing that mattered to them was getting ahead and stepping on people to get there and finances and, man, they, what's with them? I don't know what happened to them. Jesus happened to them. And then he took up his residency in their life. And little by little, those old things pass away if they allow him to, and all things will become new. That's cool. You're the temple of the living God. I was going to ask earlier, hey, my time's passed, I've got to shut up. You can have what you want from God if you cooperate. You may be here this morning and say, man, Preacher, my life is a mess. That's the kind of lives, that's the kind of buildings Jesus wants to refurbish. That's the kind he's looking for. And he's got a plan how to do it. If you want him to change your life, you can come to him, offer him what you have, and say, here it is. Come live within me. Come and be Lord. Come and make my life holy. Change me. I'm yours. Let's bow our hearts, eyes closed. I wonder if there's anybody here like that. And they say, Pastor, I really need, I really need Jesus in my life. And, and uh, I didn't think he'd ever want to live in my life, but today you've talked about it. And I believe he wants my life. And I'm ready to give it to him. I want him to change me. I want him to live within me. I want him to do a work in me. And I'd like you to pray for me that's you, I want you to slip up a hand real quickly. The Holy Spirit's dealing with you. Just, just high, we'll be sure. You can take it back down. Others? Sure, several. See, we're doing work for God here. And please give me a little time. This is church. We're not playing church. It's not a service club. We're here because we want to be in business with God. And, and several of you have raised your hands that, boy, this is what I want. Christ in me. I need that change. I need him to do a work. I need him to make me that temple of the Holy Spirit where God dwells with me. Uh, I'm going to ask a few of my deacons to come quickly. Now listen, it, if you raised your hand, this is not a time to be embarrassed or say, you know, Satan's going to say, well, you don't need to follow this through. This is crazy. You know, you already raised your hand. But I always found if you want something bad enough, you go after it, right? And you maybe have been saved for a while and raised your hand too. And, but we need, we need this recommitment. Maybe you don't know God at all. Maybe he's never lived within your life. And in just a moment, we're going we're gonna to ask you to, if you raised your hand, we're going to ask you to follow that up with some prayer. 
got to give me a little time. I'm looking for somebody here. Well, I don't see him. Okay. Honey, maybe you could help. Right here. I'm going to close the service in a moment, but don't pass this wonderful opportunity up to let God begin to reconstruct. You say, here, you're used to ruling. Where you, where you reign, God, you're an authority. I want you to be authority in my life. Where you, where you are in heaven, you call the shots. It's indisputable. And boy, is heaven beautiful. Is that a cool place? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. As he can do his will here as well as heaven, if you'll allow him to. When I close in prayer, you're all going to be dismissed. Go out and have a cup of coffee. Visit one another or, or pray for each other. How would you want to do? Maybe you're sick in body. I don't know. We believe God can not only, only save, but he can heal too. Amen? Or maybe you're, you've got a difficult thing you need prayer for. We want, you, we want you to come. But especially those of you that raised your hands. I want you to come for some prayer. Come for some prayer. In fact, let's do that now. If you raise your hand, could you just come? Come on, don't be embarrassed. I want to do some business with God this morning. I'm going to wait for you for a little bit. You say, well, I'm, I'm embarrassed. What if the person next to me sees me? That person next to you should be bringing you. He should be praying with you. Come on. God wants to do something. How bad do you want him to do it? Any others? How bad do you want him to do it? This is your opportunity. Come on. Let's do work with him. The Bible said we confess. We've got, we got to take some steps. We've got to not just expect God to come and do everything. He's calling us out to, to do this. You felt God working on your heart already. You raised your hand. So, come on, just finish it. Let's pray together. Any others? Maybe as I say this closing prayer, some of the others will stay as others leave and, uh, and have some prayer. Awesome God. Awesome God. Father, we sense your presence in this building this morning. And you didn't come just to meet us on Sunday. You come to live in our hearts when we walk out those doors. And what we say, what we do, every part of our life, you want to be a part of that. You want to make us into people that will show your glory. So when we others see us they say what happened to you and we can give you glory by saying Jesus did it Jesus did it and they see Christ in us so be with your people Lord help us shine forth help us to let you build a temple a suitable place for your dwelling it's awesome awesome God that you love us that much to come and dwell with us be with us we love you we give you praise in Jesus' name and everyone.